that's why my the streaming from my end was not going through uh, so that's why we have found a workaround uh, now sarvesh is streaming this uh, slide while well, i'll just be making the um, talking through the slides uh, so my name is balaji i'm a um, b mba uh, graduate i'm a partner in chandran's poultry farm and uh, kasturi breeding farm um, so these are two farms engaged in egg production and also the broiler uh, uh, hatchery business and we have been in this business uh, since 1983 onwards um, so without further ado we'll get into the presentation next slide uh, sarvesh yeah so this is how we have the presentation structured we'll be dealing with history technological breakthroughs industry evolution and structure the present trends uh, current trends uh, directions for the future and the conclusion now uh, we'll be going through the same structure twice or thrice in the presentation because we have want to deal with uh, uh, the layer business the egg business uh, the meat business and also the hatchery business so we'll be um, and the way that we have uh, structured this is for a general audience so there are not a lot of statistics uh, that will be presented it will be for the um, general audience to understand and appreciate the development of the um, the poultry industry over the years in fact the history of the poultry industry spans over 5000 years and um, so we'll go uh, back to the very beginning to understand uh, when the chicken was really domesticated next slide please so if you look at the history the chickens were first domesticated in the indus valley around 3000 bc um so we know this because in the indus valley uh, in the archaeological findings we have found chicken bones in large numbers and uh, this is testament to fact that the chicken uh, chicken was actually indeed domesticated in the indus valley civilization this is something uh, that we indian should all be proud of and the other interesting fact is all the modern breeds of the chicken are descended from the red jungle fowl of india and uh, this is found in the um, jungles of the uh, northern india we don't see them here uh, but we do have another jungle fowl in the southern parts of india which is the grey jungle fowl and scientists have found out that the grey jungle fowl also is one of the ancestors of the modern chicken and they have um, sort of proved that the yellow skin of the poultry actually comes from the grey jungle fowl uh, which is found in southern india so we have two ancestors the red jungle fowl um, gallus gallus and uh, the grey jungle fowl <clears throat> next slide please. now actually at this point uh, we have to wonder uh, really this is something which is very interesting thing to me as a student of ornithology why people chose chicken for domestication and not the other wild birds in fact india has about 1300 species of birds uh, in the wild and why specifically chicken uh, why not let's say um, a peafowl or a, um, let's say pigeon uh, the other varieties of uh, birds that are out there and the answer uh, has to do with in my opinion there is no scientific uh, theory backing this this is just a second guess um in my opinion it has to do with the some of the peculiar traits of the chicken chicken has like a fairly the grey jungle fowls or the uh, red jungle fowls have a fairly large clutch size i mean at one time um during the breeding season they lay anywhere between 6 to 12 eggs in one go whereas the most of the wild birds they just lay one egg or uh, Three to four at the maximum. Very rarely we see the numbers exceeding that. And the other thing that works in favor of the chicken is that uh, it is a ground feeding, ground nesting bird, and uh, essentially a very limited flight. So it is very lends itself easily for uh, domestication of the chicken. And uh, the other thing is the the chicks uh, are independent of their parents right at birth. In ornithological terms, they call it. Uh, i mean um there are two terms which describe whether they are dependent on their parents at birth 
or they are independent. The terms are altricial and um, nudifugus, I think. So chicken happens to be one of the uh, breeds of birds where they are independent at birth. And the other thing is its large size. Service the next slide. Yeah, so the large size, the ground uh, roosting, ground feeding, limited flight, uh, very good clutch size, has a good lifespan. In the wild, the chicken is able to, uh, the jungle fowls are able to live for close to five years. It has a good taste, and the chicks are independent at birth. So I think these are the reasons why a chicken um, was able to um, be domesticated in the first place. Next slide. So we'll look at some of the technological breakthroughs which, which have really led to the scaling up of chicken. Uh, at the moment, we, uh, we have to consider a fact that at the time that we are talking, um, the chicken, uh, the number of chicken in the world exceeds the number of people in the world right now. And that, this was not always the case. And uh, chicken has become a staple food for almost all the countries in the world. And we'll see uh, why that came to be and some of the technological breakthroughs behind that. Next slide, Sarvesh. So actually, I think the first turning point in the history of uh, domestication of the chicken came in the Roman Empire. And uh, previous, and uh, um, before uh, the Christian era, you know, I think apart from the uh, short experiment with the domestication in the Indus Valley, the chicken didn't uh, really, the volumes didn't really scale up. And the first large scale poultry farms were established in the uh, Rome, uh, Rome, ancient Rome. And the reason for that is fairly simple because Romans prior to the British Empire, uh, they ruled pretty much um, the entire Europe and uh, parts of Asia as well. So they always had an army on the move. And uh, for that army on the move, they needed nutritious food. And the chicken provided that. And uh, this really helped the uh, uh, Romans conquer so many territories. So chicken farms were established large scales. Uh, when, we take, uh, when we say large scales, we mean um, chicken uh, co-ops of the size of uh, 5,000, 10,000 birds. Next slide, please. And the second uh, turning point in the scaling up of the poultry industry came with the breakthrough of artificial incubation. That is incubation of the eggs without the help of chicken, um, the mother hen. Uh, now, interestingly, 2000 years ago, the ancient Chinese and uh, Egyptians independently, they discovered artificial incubation. And uh, the interesting thing about uh, Egypt is that some of the uh, uh, some of the caves uh, structures they used for artificial incubation are still in use even today. And uh, for those who are interested in uh, looking at those caves, uh, for some of the pictures, you can visit the website given below. And also, I think I'll share these links uh, later in the WhatsApp interaction for for those who are interested. They can visit and learn about it more. And uh, this is uh, on the right, uh, what you see is a description of the caves and how um, um, they, uh, the eggs were uh, given heat, uh, humidity, and also um, vents for uh, aeration of the chicken. So these caves are still in use, and some of the hatchability that these uh, caves are, are reporting are um, by far uh, very superior. In fact, um, equal to all the modern hatcheries we have here uh, in India. Next slide, please. Uh, the interesting uh, thing about uh, photoperiodism is that uh, scientists discovered this in the 16th and 17th century, uh, where uh, when just about the time when Mendel discovered the genetics, uh, where long periods of light followed by short periods will introduce a mating behavior in species that normally breeds in autumn. So uh, as you very well know, there are flowering plants uh, which 
bloom in the summers, flowering plants which bloom only in winters. And uh, scientists discovered that by uh, alternating the lighting patterns, they are able to bring these flowers to bloom at any time they wish. And uh, we need not wait for uh, spring or autumn. And uh, uh, that was achieved by use of artificial lighting. And um, they, uh, they also used this uh, thing with jungle folds and found that the jungle folds typically come into production during just before the onset of the monsoon. And the scientists uh, discovered that it was because of the long periods of day length that preceded the monsoon. And uh, uh, yeah, I think there's some person who's not able to hear voice. Is this the case with others? Sarvesh? No, no. We can hear you. No, we can hear. Yeah, okay. I think we maybe can hear that's voice, uh, Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, let me clear one thing. Those who can't uh, listen to the presentation, please check your audio setting. It will be at the left bottom corner. Yeah, we can continue. Yeah, so by using the artificial light, people were, uh, scientists were able to emulate the conditions of the spring throughout the year. And that was a critical turning point for the large scale uh, scaling up of uh, the poultry industry. Next slide, please. So at this juncture, even though the poultry was able to scale up, but it remained a regional business, mainly because there was no safe means to transport the uh, eggs from the farm to the hatchery. And uh, that was because the, the uh, people used to carry these eggs in the baskets and lots of eggs used to be damaged in transit. So in 1906, um, a, a gentleman uh, by name, Thomas Peter, um, from Liverpool, UK, it discovered an egg carton where the eggs could be transported easily. And uh, in 1911, uh, in uh, United States, a person by name Joseph Coyle um, of British Columbia, he discovered uh, egg packaging um, trays, which uh, could easily transport a huge volume of eggs to the market without any breakage. So this was a very critical turning point for the transport of eggs. Next slide, please. So in the 1920s, uh, this is uh, essentially the pre-war era, where the industry began to specialize into uh, egg type birds and the meat type birds. Prior to this, birds were always like uh, either uh, egg type or meat type. Um, so what used to happen is, uh, uh, the same, um, I mean, during the week, the, the eggs from the birds used to be collected and uh, family um, on the weekend, they used to, um, uh, you know, um, they used to so use the same bird for meat for a Sunday uh, afternoon lunch. And uh, because of this, like uh, the chicken meat or the eggs was not something that was available throughout the year. Um, but later, uh, in the 1920s, because of the uh, 1920s and 30s, um, immediately after the World War I and prior to the World War II, uh, the birds uh, began to specialize. When we go to the broiler meat industry, we'll, um, history, we'll, learn, we'll see some of the factors which uh, contributed to the specialization. But now, right now, we are going to proceed with the uh, egg industry. Next slide, please. So if you look at the difference between a layer and a broiler, a layer is typically what lays eggs, and a broiler is what gives us meat. They are not the same birds. They are completely different, grown in uh, completely different environments, uh, different uh, feeding conditions, and uh, uh, on uh, different housing systems as well. So a, co a commercial layer today, um, the lifespan is about 72 weeks. The broiler is about five to six weeks. Uh, in the 72 weeks that the layer bird lives, it is able to produce 330 eggs per bird. Whereas a broiler is able to produce two kgs of meat in that five to six weeks of its lifespan. So if you look at the efficiency, um, a layer is able to give seven eggs per kilo of feed 
uh, given to it whereas the broiler is able to give uh, 1 kg of meat for every 1.5 uh, to 1.7 kg of feed it consumes so in feeding um, the layer is uh, a given ad lib feeding in the uh, in the sense that it uh, it can take uh, an unlimited quantity of feed but uh, broiler is giving a given a restricted feeding um, and the rearing system is in cages typically in cages in layers and typically on the floor in, in the cage of uh, broilers now you might find uh, in some farms where the layers are uh, reared in uh, flora and in some farms where the broilers are uh, grown in deep litter i mean in cages but the, this is really an exception to the rule the uh, the proportion of the birds is uh, rather uh, minuscule next slide please so the layer industry we are going to look at some of the um, um, some history uh, current status and uh, future trends and then we'll go to the broiler industry and finally we'll end with the uh, the incubator uh, or the uh, hatchery industry next slide please so um, when we discuss the uh, turning points for the uh, technological breakthroughs which enabled the modern poultry one of the critical problems that the early farmers faced was that um, the they were getting a very good productivity in an open area whereas like in a closed uh, space they were not getting um, a very good productivity and uh, initially the farmers didn't understand why but there were a lot of problems with uh, maintaining birds in an open area because the birds were uh, uh, used to be picked up by other birds so bigger birds of prey they used to be you know targeted by um, wild animals like foxes and uh, they were also exposed to the extremities of the climate which the uh, farmers felt uh, they could uh, manage the climate better in an enclosed space or a, uh, a co-op as it is called and uh, scientists came up with this product called vitamin d3 which they um, which is not available in any of the feed ingredients naturally it has to be synthesized from the sun so when the scientists were able to synthesize vitamin d3 that became a big turning point in keeping the birds in the open area and then moving them to enclosed spaces now uh, this this really was a big turning point because earlier the chicken used to be grown in only the sun belt uh, areas where uh, places where they were getting ample sun throughout the year uh, in us it uh, typically is in uh, california texas that belt whereas the northern districts were uh, um, were not able to grow chicken uh, very effectively now uh, this uh, breakthrough changed all that next slide please next thing is like um, uh, the farmers were able to move the birds into co-ops but um, in the 1920s um, the from the co-ops it was developed uh, um, and the birds were enclosed into cages as you see in the right this happened in the 1920s and this happened in california and even today the cages that you see uh, in most farms are resemble uh, the cages that you see here where they are able to um get feed uh, they get water and uh, their their uh, droppings are separated from the birds so the egg hygiene is maintained and the it was very easy to manage the birds uh, opposed to growing them in uh, chicken co-ops so this was another big breakthrough uh, next slide please yeah so we'll briefly discuss about the industry structure because uh, people uh, when they think uh, broiler industry they assume that it is very backyard farm, farm kind of activity a very cottage industry kind of an activity but they'll be surprised at some of the volumes and uh, some of the value chain of the broiler industry or the the, uh, the poultry industry next slide please so if you really look at it um, 
there is the purulent stage, the grandparent stage, parent stage, laying uh, hen, egg production, and after that uh, there is egg packaging and processing, uh, supermarkets and food services. So in only in the final tier of the pyramid does it reach the consumers. So most of the genetics happens in the purulent breeding stage. So what um, uh, kind of genetics is like? For example, if you are uh, selecting for a egg type laying hen. There'll be some kind of desirable characters like the bird should be a, a prolific egg layer. Um, it should be able to produce in today's standards more than 330 eggs per year, and um, it should have a good, uh, um, you know, susceptibility against, you know, resistance against diseases. Excuse me, uh, resistance against diseases. It should uh, have a good persistent productivity and so on and so forth. So what um, happens at the pure line stage is that selection is done and only the birds with these desirable characters uh, are, uh, are propagated and their offsprings are passed on to the next stage, which is a grandparent production stage. So one bird at the pure line breeding stage becomes 100 at the grandparent stage and pa uh, it becomes 10,000 at the parent uh, stage and a 12 lakh in the laying um, egg production stage and the egg production stage it produces 600 million eggs from that one pure line breeding stock we are able to get 600 million uh, eggs and after that is the egg packaging and processing um, so i think uh, that gives you a fair idea and i think if there are any questions uh, we'll take it at the uh, q and a part next slide please so present status of the egg industry in India. Um, we'll show some pictures of the farms, uh, the present conditions, and what are the some of the trends that we are seeing that are happening. Uh, next slide. So India, if you look at some of the statistics, India is like third in the um, in the number of uh, egg production worldwide. If you look at it, India is third. China is leading the world in egg production, uh, uh, followed by United States and India. Next slide. And, but uh, on the other side, our per capita consumption of eggs is abysmally low when compared to the other countries. And we'll also explore um, the consequences of this low per capita consumption towards the end of the uh, presentation. Next slide. So these are some pictures of our uh, uh, farms. Uh, this, um, what you see in the bottom is like a typical um, um, shed in which uh, chicks are grown. And uh, the next stage is called growers, which you see on the top. So this is um, how a typical poultry farm looks like now. Next slide. So this is a view inside the shed on the left. Uh, you have like very young um, birds. Um, on the right, you have like birds which are in uh, production. You can see the comb is uh, different in the young birds and in the uh, egg laying birds. Next slide, please. So, and this is uh, some pictures uh, I want to show to explain about the automation level that we have reached. Right now, the what you see on the left is a, a silo where the feed for the birds is loaded onto the silos and it is automatically dispensed to the birds uh, um, into the right. So there's no human intervention here. So because of this, we have really able to save a huge quantum of labor and uh, feed uh, <clears throat> contamination because of multiple handling. So we were able to save because of the silo-based auto feeding. The, the pictures are from our own farm near uh, Coimbatore. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, what you see here is like an egg conveyor belt. So the again, the eggs are also in uh, some of the farms, they are not being ha uh, handled by humans. The eggs, um, there's a slope in each of the cages, the egg roll out and they come to the conveyor and from the conveyor uh, they are uh, they are loaded onto the trays 
what you see on the right. Um, this is from these pictures are from our own farm uh, near Coimbatore again. So we have the egg conveyors installed. So the feed is automated, the watering is automated, the egg collection is also automated. So the the quantum of labor involved in the poultry operations have really come down drastically in the recent years. Next slide, please. So uh, we'll see some of the current trends which are happening in the egg industry. Next slide. So there is an increasing number of uh, farms, uh, excuse me, where they, uh, they are going for environmental controlled sheds in which the temperature, the humidity, and several such parameters are controlled. The shed is completely enclosed. And uh, the birds are uh, kept at a comfortable, productive uh, climate throughout the year. I mean, irrespective of whether it is a summer or a winter, they are kept at a very comfortable uh, climate. So this is something that is happening. And uh, even though the South has been a little slow to adapt to this new trend, there are a lot of farms in the Northern India which have adapted to these environment controlled sheds, mainly because they faced, uh, face a lot of environmental extremities um, uh, where there's extremely high temperatures in the summer or extremely cold uh, winters. So environmental controlled sheds really help to maintain the uh, flock at these extreme temperatures. And this is a, re a fairly recent trend. In the last five years, we are seeing this happening. Next slide, please. And uh, packaging and branding of eggs is uh, catching up. Uh, even in uh, today's supermarkets, you will find a number of uh, eggs uh, being available in uh, six egg and 12 egg packs. What you see on the right um, is uh, packaged eggs, uh, branded eggs, which we developed uh, way back in 2009. So this is also something catching on. I think we'll see more of this in the future. Next slide, please. So some of the direction for the future where we see the poultry industry going, we'll just discuss briefly in a few slides. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is a modern feed mill um, there are uh, feed mills like this even in India, where uh, all the feed raw materials are loaded onto silos, batched according to the feed formula, and then the final output is uh, given. There are a lot of um, feed mills like this coming up, and this is the way forward. Next slide. And another trend which is happening is in the Western countries and the lot of Southeast Asian countries as well. We see. Uh, the eggs being sold in like uh, as liquid in the format. Liquid format in the sense they are just taken out of the shell, pasteurized and uh, stored in these uh, cans. So the people have, don't have to worry about dealing with uh, the eggshells and the disposing of the eggshells. So it's, uh, and they are assured of the uh, quality of the eggs also. So this is something that we are uh, going to see more of in the future. Next slide. So, uh, this, so this is a typical uh, line in which uh, the eggshells are being processed. The complete construction is in stainless steel and uh, with the cleaning in process. And uh, so what happens is the egg, uh, eggs are being broken. They are being pasteurized. Pasteurized in the sense they are taken to a slightly higher temperature which destroys all the bacteria. And then they are packed into cans uh, like the one that you see um, see below. Uh, plant, so this is something that we are going to see more of uh, in the coming years. So I think um, uh, we have about five or uh, odd minutes left. Um, we might get disconnected while I'm making the presentation. No worries. I suggest that you guys uh, log in to the uh, same uh, using the same meeting ID and password again. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Bala, we will yeah. stop at uh, one point where you finish with one of subject. So then we can stop. Okay. And we can start another session with new topic. So there won't be any interruption. Okay, right. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, when the two minutes are left, we will stop. Okay. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is something that is uh, also happening. 
eggs are being powdered and what you see below is like the yolk being separated the white being separated and uh, uh, you also get a mix of this the advantages of these uh, egg powders is that they are again very easy to transport because the moisture content is uh, removed and uh, people who pr prefer uh, egg whites they can take egg whites separately they can take uh, the yolk separately and this is uh, going to be a game changer uh, in the future we already have like five or six egg powdering plants in india as we speak and we are only going to see a lot more in the future next slide please so i think this uh, with this we have come to the end of the the layer or the egg type business i think we'll uh, end the um, presentation at this point and uh, when we join in again we'll talk about the broiler industry and the uh, hatchery industry and then finally take the q and a okay i'll stop the meeting here you can log in using the same credentials yeah okay